Welcome to this session on uh, complex data and harmonization. We have three really great speakers with us today. Um, <clears throat> we will have uh, a presentation followed by uh, a brief time for questions and then hope to have some questions at the end as well. Our first speaker is Kay Mars. Kay is Archive Manager for the National Addiction and HIV Data Archive Program at ICPSR. Her responsibilities include acquisitions, outreach, support for depositors, data processing plans and implementation, technical outreach, and user support. She's been with ICPSR since 1991. Prior to joining NODAP, she was a processing supervisor for the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data, and she has supervised the processing and release of data on the relationship of alcohol and other drugs and crime, domestic violence, youth and crime victimization, corrections and prisoner reentry, policing, crime prevention, terrorism, and crime mapping in geographic information systems. She holds an MS in criminal justice from Michigan State University and a BA in psychology from the University of Michigan. So welcome, Kay. Good morning. Can everyone hear me all right? I know I'm kind of soft-spoken, so raise your hand if uh, you happen to not be able to continue to hear me. Let's start with a definition of what is data harmonization. Uh, data harmonization is the use of procedures aimed at achieving or at least improving the comparability of different surveys or measures. And so what are the reasons to harmonize data? While collecting high quality data requires a major investment of resources and in uh, tight economies like what we have, um, it may, by har creating a harmonized data set, you can get high quality data to use for your project with more limited resources. Even if your budget is not tight, few one-off studies provide very large numbers of respondents to achieve sufficient sample size for adequate statistical power especially if you have a lot of subpopulations or you want to create numerous subsets. So by combining data sets, you can get more um, numbers, more cases to use for your analyses. And as um, Jim Lynch, who taught our BJS summer uh, workshop for ICPSR for many years, and who's now director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics in Washington, he once said that by mixing and matching data, you get the best juice. So um, that's just another way of saying that uh, a harmonized data file can be where the whole is, is actually more than just the sum of the individual parts. So when is data harmonization needed? Well, whenever you want to conduct comparisons over time or comparisons across sites. In general, for comparative analyses to be done, the data have to be comparable and if they are not comparable, they have to be harmonized to make them comparable before you can do your analyses. You can use uh, two overarching approaches to harmonizing data. One is a stringent approach, which uses identical data collection tools and procedures. It achieves a high degree of comparability, um, so it's considered ideal, but it's also difficult to adhere to fully over time and across sites. So you may use a flexible approach, which is use a sound methodology to ensure that the concepts have inferential equivalence. So each participating study is assessed for its ability to um, create common concepts, comparable co classification schemes, and the target variables that you want for your analyses, even though the data were not necessarily collected with identical tools or procedures. Within this, uh, these um, harmonization strategies, there's also three more specific approaches you can use. There, you can use ex post output harmonization, which um, is an approach that uses data, like data from archives such as ICPSR, to make them comparable after the data are collected uh, by, through a conversion procedure which creates harm, 
harmonize target variables from the original input variables. Or if you're planning to collect new data, you have two options. You can use input harmonization, which seeks to impose strict measurement processes and methods uh, before the data are collected and through the data life cycle. Each site uses the same definitions, indicators, um, classifications, and technical requirements. And you'll consider input harmonization if the uh, data collection is centrally coordinated, because you'll need that central coordination to keep everything um, the same across all sites and time. Or you can use an ex anti output harmonization approach in which the harmonization project the harmonization project is, is integrated within the planning so that common goals, measurements, and concepts are created and the plan is made for uh, key for target variables to be created because you know you're getting the key variables at the time of data collection. Questions may vary from site to site. Um, only the outputs are harmonized. So it is left to the individual sites to collect their own data and uh, process their own data. And you can use this approach when the data collection is governed by the individual sites and there's agreement on um, standardization across the sites. So Peter Granda and Emily Blazecheck has provided us with guidelines on how to uh, conduct a harmonization project, and so I thought I'd go through these steps. Um, first, you need to decide on a harmonization strategy. Uh, can you use input harmonization, or will you need to use some form of output harmonization? Can you use a stringent approach, or are you going to need to be more flexible? You want to create an initial plan and define clear objectives about what you want to achieve. So it's good to form an advisory committee early on and to meet with your experts um, from time to time throughout the process. You want to implement a systematic uh, process with appropriate quality controls and as well you'll want to make all your data transformations reversible. It's always good to have that backup key or that erase key. Uh, so plan to be able to reverse what transformations you've done. You're going to come to realize that not all concepts can be harmonized. Uh, for example, if you want to compare rates of divorce across countries, because divorce is governed by laws and cultures differently in, in countries, this is a concept that you may not be able to harmonize across nations. You want to record all your decisions systematically so that you can capture all of the details of your project. And fortunately, there are now uh, harmonization software tools available so you can investigate whether any of those can, uh, are available to help with your project. Harmonizing data is not just uh, creating target variables and harmonized variables. It's actually harmonizing the entire project. So in addition to looking at variables, you want to look at how similar are the sampling and inclusion criteria, the periods of data collection and follow-up, field procedures and mode of data collection, how similar were the instruments constructed as well, including the translations and any adaptations that were made to the instruments uh, across sites or for specific sites. How did data editing and coding rules uh, affect what you can and cannot harmonize? How are non-response rates and uh, non-response and weights from the original data files? How will they affect the uh, harmonized data file? in their response weights and uh, the, the, the weight variables and the variance estimates that you're going to get from the harmonized file. And as always, you want to document, document, document all planned and ad hoc decisions. You want to develop criteria for measuring the quality of the harmonization process. Um, the Statistical Office of the European Communities has um, developed some criteria to do this. You can use um, user testing of people who are knowledgeable about the characteristics of your project to help you uh, determine how well you are meeting these, char uh, these characteristics. 
So you want to look at the relevance of your statistical concepts. Are you creating something that the research community really needs in a way that they want to analyze it? What are the accuracy of your estimates, the topicality and timeliness of the dissemination of your results? How accessible and clear is your information? Did you achieve the comparability that you expected uh, with your project? How coherent was your plan? Was it well-reasoned and consistent throughout the project? And for completeness, you want to look at the degree in which the original information is preserved in the harmonized data. And the last step is to provide the widest range of data and documentation products that you can from your, product, from your project. And uh, this is what uh, both Beth Ellen and, and uh, Peter will be talking about later, their projects and how they're disseminating, how they conducted their projects, but also how they're disseminating the information. You want to document each target variable and the source variables, the transformation algorithms, and any deviations that occurred from your intended approach. You want to, if at all possible, provide access to the original data files. Um, even if you have to create restricted data use agreements because the original files have confidential information, because one of the ide main ideas is that people should be able to take the original file, use your information, and recreate and check what you did, and maybe even extend or do something different. So you want to provide the code for creating target variables, and you want to provide as complete of documentation as you can. Uh, one thing that's recommended is a crosswalk file which shows all the variables in the original individual data files and how they map to variables in the, um, in the harmonized file. One of the goals of um, taking the time and effort to create a harmonized data file is to encourage research by others uh, by making the harmonized data a long-term resource to the research community. Harmonized data files, particularly those with a cross-cultural or cross-national focus, are very popular and uh, are, are wanted for use. However, the complexity of the whole undertaking presents unique challenges for data producers when they want to disseminate the information because of the large number of decisions that are made um, there's the possibility of critical information being lost on one hand, and on the other hand, you have to manage all of the decisions and find a way to make clear what you did to potential users of the data. So version control is very important. Um, people need to know what version of the data file they're using, as well as if the file they're using has been updated and for what reason. You want to retrieve. Uh, research, research resources, which would be like papers, publications, and other replication efforts that were based on analysis of the harmonized data, whether it was done by you or other people, so that you can make them available as a resource for your project. You want to be able to update uh, your files and your information based on user feedback, and you should develop procedures to collect and distribute new recodes and subsets that are created by you or also by other researchers over time. A harmonized data file uh, presents training opportunities, both in using, uh, training people to use the harmonized data file and understanding what, uh, understanding the content, but also for ICPSR, we like to use data to teach statistical methods and techniques. So it provides a high quality data set for more training. National statistical agencies and other data producers uh, can and often do uh, distribute files on their own websites, but there is the role of collaborating, there is the role of data archives to collaborate in such a process. Uh, data archives um, know what users want. We are skilled at creating rich metadata to help discovery of the information. And we can also produce multiple versions of files so that we can find, uh, produce files in, in the formats that researchers want to use. We can also help with long-term preservation of the project files. Uh, we can create normalized versions of the files. And from our archive versions, we can update the files to new formats or repurpose the files in other ways uh, over time to continue making the project uh, up to date. 
For the remainder of my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the ex post output harmonization that I did for my master's thesis. And I developed an integrative model of exposure to violence, aggression, and violent offending. In order to test my model that I developed for the, the, my thesis required that I had data that captured all of the measures that I needed for the model, um, exposure, to, exposure to violence, um, offending, as well as measures of aggressiveness in one from similar measures in one data set. And fortunately for me, the MacArthur Foundation had recently funded uh, ICPSR to provide uh, data from the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods. It's a um, data series with 680 data files and 60,000 variables plus, so I was able to find the variables I needed for my project. The PhDCN uh, used a diverse sample. The respondents were of multiple ethnicities. They were from urban neighborhoods because they're all from Chicago, but they specifically selected a mix of social, economic status, and ethnic neighborhoods. And the respondents were both males and females. It was a general population sample using a longitudinal perspective design. They obtained similar measures from multiple informants, and so for my project, I used data both from the adolescent and, their, and his or her primary caregiver. I used only cohort 15, which meant that they were either six months before up to six months after their 15th birthday when they were selected to be in the study. Um, cohort 15 was unique in that the, their caregiver reported about relationship conflict uh, with their partner at waves one and two, but the adolescents were now young adults at wave three, so they reported about their relationship conflict at wave three. So I had the history of relationship conflict in the, from the parents and then the uh, adolescents, now young adults, uh, conflict as well for comparison. At wave three, there was just a little under 500 young adults in the sample. My final uh, analysis sample had 335 young adults, in part because of missing data. I did impute wherever defensible for uh, missing data, but also at wave three, only the young adults who reported being in a relationship in the past year uh, have responses to the conflict tactic scale with their partner. So that reduced the available cases. My final analysis data file um, used data, 22 different data, PhD SAN data files that originally had over 3,900 variables and I recoded and harmonized and otherwise scrunched this all down into one data file with 60 variables. The, um, the me violence measures I used were primarily from these scales here, the conflict tactic scale for partner and spouse, the conflict tactic scale for parent and child, which was the PC was only, uh, the caregiver was the only respondent. The adolescent reported about their offending and their exposure to violence in all three waves and the caregiver reported um, on the supervision scale for waves one and two. This table shows the items that I used from each of those um, instruments. The uh, reference period for all of the instruments was in the past year. However, the items, the, um, the coding, and um, the respondents changed um, over the waves. So the superscripts on each of the items, I hope you can see that, there's a one, two, and three. Um, that indicates which wave the item was available. I considered using just the common uh, uh, items for each wave, but for like the conflict tactic scale, although you can see that there are you know, about 15 items, I would have been only been able to use about six if I would have used only the common measures across all three waves. So in the end, we decided not for me to really harmonize the file, but to use all of the reported violence by the informant in each wave, even though they weren't from common measures or com common items. Um, and just for context, my, my um, project looked at um, only 
violence that um, you could learn through modeling because I was looking at social learning theory and also um, serious violence. So I looked at psychological severe items as well as physical minor and physical severe items and that comes into play in just a minute here. Um, I did harmonize the response categories. The conflict tactic scales, both versions in waves one and three, had response categories, which for my data I recoded to midpoint values so I could have a count variable as my dependent measure. The self-report of offending scale captured, um, they, they asked them the number of times that they uh, committed certain offenses so they could give any number, so that was easy for me to recode to the same midpoint values. However, in wave two, the conflict tactics scales, both versions, um, the response categories were just yes and no. And um, they also reduced it down to just physical uh, conflict items. So I was not able to include uh, the psychological severe items. We considered whether to make my dependent measure, therefore, a, a binary outcome variable. Um, but in the end, we decided that um, we wanted to keep as much data as I could have for my model. So we left count variables for ways one and three and binary for ways one and two. Um, the exposure to violence scale um, also had response categories, but they were different response categories. So, and those are shown here on the slide. What we did is we created midpoint values that was as close as we could approximate to the conflict tactic scale categories uh, by trying to get the, uh, similar intervals between the values. And finally, for the caregiver's supervision scale, um, it was a different uh, instrument for waves one and two. In wave one, the responses were just yes and no. For waves two, they allowed them to provide more detail. So exam for example, to the question, does the subject uh, have a certain time he or she needs to be home on school nights, in waves two, they could also say that their, their child doesn't go out. And so we had to decide what we were going to do with that. How do we make that a yes or no answer? And we decided since at wave two, these uh, adolescents are now about, they average uh, eight, 17 years old. So if they're not going out, there's a de facto curfew in there. So we decided to count them as a yes. Um, there maybe is no right or wrong answer. That's what we decided to do. Uh, to the answer to the question about does the subject usually obey their curfew at wave two there were four categories they could use what we decided is that the categories of all the time and most of the time uh, were like 50 percent or more they were obeying their curfew so we counted it as a yes and some of the time it almost never sounded like maybe less than 50 percent of the time they were obeying their curfew so we counted that as a no um, these examples show that um, when you're collecting data over time, there can be um, interest in using an updated version of, of your instrument. Uh, the conflict tactic scale did come out with a new version and it was considered an improved version. So I'm sure they decided, tried to decide whether to keep, use a new version or to stay with the version they'd used six years ago and um, they decided to change versions. Um, they also seem to have done some changes to reduce respondent ver burden um, with uh, reducing the wave two to yes and no, but then those kind of decisions affect what harmonization you can do and what analysis you can do in later waves. These are the resources I use for my presentation. Um, Peter Granda and Emily Blaze, Blaze check, <laughs> uh, publication as well as uh, the Fortier um, article talks about the pros and cons of a stringent or uh, flexible approach. And then there's the um, information about the CPS uh, project, which Beth Ellen, Beth Ellen will talk about uh, next. Okay. <laughs>